Hello, hello, good evening, everybody. Once again, we are back with another wildlife talk. Uh, hello, Antoinette. Glad you could join me. And we'll see who else comes stumbling in with us today. You know what? I'm actually going to change something here. No, that's okay. We'll leave it as it is. So we are talking birds. Birds, birds, bird is the word is what we are talking about tonight. Uh, we had a couple birds in particular that we'll be talking about. One is the pigeon at the top of the screen, top left. Next will be the European starling at the top right, and then the English house sparrow, or just the common house sparrow at the bottom right of the screen here. So uh, the special thing about these birds is these are the, um, these three in particular to the United States are the only birds without federal regulation. Well, I should rephrase that, federal protection because just about every other bird in the United States is under the Migratory Bird Act. That is the Federal Migratory Bird Act that basically makes it so you cannot do anything, hurt a bird, deter a bird while nesting or anything like that. These do not have it because these are listed as an invasive species. They are not native to North America by any stretch of the imagination and they are actually very, they're environmentally dangerous for their ecosystems. Um, starting off with the pigeon. Uh, the actual name of the pigeon, or at least this one, is the rock dove, or the common pigeon. Uh, they're most no, oh, they're in the dove family. Pigeons, the pigeon family, is related to the dodo, the extinct flightless bird is related to the pigeon. So there's a lot to unpack with that <laughs> in terms of understanding the intelligence of these birds. Um, there are quite literally about a thousand different specific breeds of pigeons. They are all over the world. Uh, you can find them most of the time in most major cities um, as a typical aesthetic of the city itself. But they are literally spread all across the world. Um, like name a few of these subspecies is the European rock dove, the Cape Verde rock dove, the Canary Islands rock dove, the Singal Senegal rock dove, Saharan rock dove, Oasis rock dove, Egyptian rock dove, Arabian rock dove, Iranian rock dove, Hume's rock dove, Indian rock dove, and Mongolian rock dove. I think we've established that they're all rock doves. That's okay. Um... They're not huge. Uh, they're about average size. I'd say a little bigger than a robin. Um, they average about 11 to a foot to a foot and a half in overall length with a wingspan of 24 to 30 inches on average. Uh, they aren't very heavy. They are anywhere from 8.5 to 14 ounces. Now you can get some beefier birds depending on how overfed they are. Um, <laughs> notes even say they can sometimes double their weight in... Um, overfed and captive uh, environments. Typical coloration is the gray-black plumage that you see on their body and wings. This is the most common coloration that you're going to find with a typical pigeon. Um, colonies or flocks for the pigeons can range anywhere to a monogamous pair to hundreds upon hundreds of birds in a city environment. Um, I oftentimes get calls from different communities to catch and remove these birds because they're being a health concern in the fact that um, they breed practically all year long. Um, and that's not a whole heck of a long time. A typical, in nature, their typical lifespan is anywhere from three to five years, but they can live up to 15 in captivity although some have been reported to live even longer than that in some rare instances. Uh, main mortality is predators and humans. Go figure. Uh, they were introduced into North America um, in 1606 at Port Royal, Nova Scotia, and that's how they got to the North American continent. They are not native to this particular bird, or none of the rock doves are necessarily native to North America. Uh, we did have some other birds that are native here and these guys just beat them out. It is quite literally what ended up happening. Um, uh, 
the passenger pigeon is the one that got beaten out from the uh, rock dove. That is actually one of the one of the pigeon species that we had here in North America that was actually native to our ecosystem. Uh, these rock doves ended up uh, making it so they couldn't survive, and they just ended up had this disappearing from history. Well, not disappearing from history. They're all you can see all of them. Uh, the physically most related bird to a passenger pigeon would be the mourning dove. If you want to know what a passenger pigeon looked like, it was very close to a mourning dove. So that is about just a brief note about the passenger pigeons. Um, the name of the uh, the family name for the pigeon is called the Columbidae. I know, sounds weird, but that's what it is. Um, and they are found in literally every continent except Antarctica. So their spray, their, their spread and range is tremendous. Um, in terms of nesting behavior, they are um, pulling up my notes here. Uh, they will rest in crevices, rock formations in the wild. Uh, they tend to find um, ledges for walls, statues, buildings, stuff like that. Um, the big issue that these guys can cause is actually their droppings. Their droppings can create, um, they, they create tremendous piles. One bird can produce 20 to 26 pounds of feces in a year. That is one bird can produce that much in one single year. So that is a lot that's a lot of poop. Um, and what also happens is because the amount of uric acid that they produce with their droppings, it is actually found to be structurally damaging to things such as girders and I-beams. Uh, I was actually doing a job in Chicago. Uh, I used to live there originally. And we, uh, the company I worked with at the time uh, had a, did a, a project for one of the bus stations underneath a bridge um, in one of the northern suburbs of Chicago. And the damage we could see from them is that the beams, the big I-beam itself, you could actually see the divot in the metal from the uric acid having eaten away at the metal once it was all scraped completely clear and scrubbed clean. <clears throat> it wasn't enough to cause the bridge to be rebuilt, but it was enough that you could see dents in the metal from the bird droppings having been there for so long. So they ended up cleaning it all off, scraping it, scrubbing it, cleaning it, and then put netting all along the underside of that overpass in order to uh, keep the birds from roosting and returning in that area. I'll touch on some of the, uh, we can make the bird deterrence a different subject a different day, but that just gives you an idea of what these birds can do. Um, I've gone, hello. Yes, hello, thank you. Thank you, Antoinette, I see you posting there. Um, let's see. Okay, um, I hate when my bookmark moves. Uh, for breeding, uh, they pretty much breed all year long. Uh, incubation period is anywhere from 17 to 19 days. Um, and they breed all year long. I have found I found a pigeon nest. I felt oh, I felt bad for this bird in particular. I get a call. Uh, there is a pigeon attempting to nest in a breezeway in an apartment complex. I'm like, okay, I'll go over see what's going on. And I get there. <laughs> this thing made what it considered a nest. It was three straws put together in a triangle that it made its nest and there was a single egg in the middle of those straws. <laughs> I felt bad for this bird and whatever fledging was going to come from it because if they constituted that as a nest, God help them. <laughs> so um, what ends up happening after that, yes, it, it did try. It tried and it, it, it didn't go well. Um, Incubation is anywhere from 19 to, uh, 17 to 19 days. Uh, the young are called squabs or nestlings. Um, they look absolutely ugly. 
Um, they will feed exclusively on what's called crop milk, and that's something a lot of different birds will produce in their crop. Is right where is where they have all their uh, their food that they store, especially for their young. Um, so when everybody talks about like a crop shot, I mean the bird got hit, hit right just below the neck and a, a, about midway up the chest. That's the crop is what they're aiming for. Um, fledgling is about 30 days long, and then they're able to fly shortly thereafter. Uh, they are uh, omnivorous, technically. They will eat whatever they can get their, their beaks around, but they will they prefer mainly fruits and grain. So you'll find a lot of people getting them with cracked corn, wheat, millet, anything you can configure, a, a pigeon can put in its beak, it'll take it. Um, these guys are hosts to different um, problems that they can pass on. One is a... Um, what we call an ectoparasite. Um, they have <clears throat> a several different species of lice that they can pass off. Uh, there's also bird mites, and um, their droppings can also do uh, cause to produce histoplasmosis, which is a respiratory lung infection. That's something that's a word that I use here a lot because a lot of animals can carry it. Um, but the bigger, <clears throat> excuse me, the bigger issue is the mites they can get uh, falling onto people as well as inside of structures. Once the birds have left their nesting area, you can actually get bird mites inside of a home if a pigeon or a pigeon flock has been roosting up inside of the eaves or anything like that. They will actually the mites will migrate looking for hosts to try to feed and live on. The thing is, human blood because mites are blood sucking creatures. Uh, they cannot reproduce on the blood from human proteins. Like the, the protein in our blood, they cannot use that to reproduce from. Bird blood protein is what they be, are able to reproduce with. Um, but yeah, the, the main things uh, for humans to be concerned about is histoplasmosis, cryptococcus, and psittacosis. Um, Long-term exposure can actually cause an allergy called bird fancier's lung. Uh, they are also they are not a major concern for West Nile West Nile virus, though they can contract it, but they can't transmit it to people. It seems, um, but they also are very uh, they are potentially a risk for carrying the avian influenza. One study has shown that adult pigeons are not clinically susceptible susceptible to the most dangerous strain of the avian influ influenza H five N one, but they did not transmit the virus to chickens. So they have their own issues that can happen with pigeons. Um, let's see. With pigeons, I mean, they're literally everywhere when it comes to the different problems with them. They actually are very commonly used as food. A lot of people actually breed and raise pigeons for meat. Um, a lot of different groups like falconers will actually try to breed pigeons. Uh, falconers will also reach out to guys like me where we do our catching and removal of pigeons and they'll use them for their birds in order to train them for falcon and hunt for falconry hunting. So that is something else that they will do with the pigeons. Uh, for myself, my any birds I get get sold or given to wildlife shelters to feed their birds predominantly. Uh, in terms of population worldwide for pigeons found, when was this when was this one done? Based on studies done as recent as 2019, there's supposedly up to a hundred and twenty million pigeons across the world. Um, an estimated 17 to 28 million in Europe alone. So you can only imagine how much worse it is in areas like North America where we make it very easy for them. So switching gears a little bit from the pigeon. Close out these notes. We're going to move on to the European starling. Uh, these are same idea, smaller, same size or as small as a robin. 
Um, they are they have a very glossy, I like to say almost like an iridescent coloration to their body. That's the, for reference, that is the picture in the upper right of this green here. Um, there are 12 different subspecies, um, ranging anywhere from Uric, the Pale Arctic, to Western Mongolia, and they have been introduced, introduced to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United States, Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, and Fiji. The problem with these birds is that um, they're bullies. They will actually, uh, and I have seen this, where um, flickers, they're, and the northern flicker is a woodpecker I have up here in this area, um, and they will actually compete for nesting locations in a knot hole on the side of a tree or in the side of a house even. Um, these guys are known cavity dwellers where they, they tend to get inside of any holes or openings that are on the side of a structure or a building or any place they can basically fit themselves to make a nest. <clears throat> there's an area, there's a place about 45 minutes north of me. It was an entire barn that was used as a gas station that I had to bird proof the entire thing. I was there for four days trying to get that handled. And that was also reaching up in there, pulling the birds out, shooing away the ones that were, and making sure that they didn't weren't able to get back into the building. Um, I have pulled, for starlings, I have pulled full nests out of dryer vents out of side of homes. I had one vent in particular. I pulled 15 pounds of nesting material out of this bathroom vent. And I was, I basically got to the point where my tools couldn't pull it out from the outside. I had to go into the house. We had to cut open the ceiling of the drywall, um, pull that out, replace the whole pipe. The pipe was actually corroding away because of the, the moisture, the feces, everything that was in that nesting and just rotted out that piece of metal. So they are, it causes way more problems for a home than one would actually anticipate. So when people say, oh, I just let them nest every year, that is something that can be happening to your home. Things to keep in mind for. Um, They're, like I said, they're a little, they're smaller than a pigeon. They are generally eight to nine to ten inches long, uh, with a wingspan of anywhere from twelve to eighteen inches across. Um, they're not big. They're, like I said, they're smaller than a robin. Their vocalization is incredibly varied, and they are noisy. These are very noisy birds. They will do burbles quick clicks, whistles, just so many different things. Um, but they have been known to do uh, m bits of mimicry, not full copying like say a lyre bird or a parrot, but they've been able to um, mildly reproduce different songs of other birds. I had one that actually <laughs> scared the heck out of me. Um, I was going to my shop one day when I was at a different location and I hear this squeak of like the initial call for a bald eagle. And I'm like, oh, there's a bald eagle around. So I'm looking around, I'm looking around, and I hear it again, that peep, peep, peep for a bald eagle. And I'm looking around, I'm staring right at the starling. I stared at him a little bit longer. And he made the call. I'm like, you son of a gun. Here I thought I had a bald eagle in my backyard. Nope, just a starling. So... I started yelling at him. He went flying away. Pretty much a half a half will do. Um, these birds will eat um, predominantly insects, but they'll feed on both pests and other arthropods. Um, they're, pre they're big bug eaters. Um, but that won't stop them from going after fruit, grain, seeds, nectar, and food waste. You see these a lot in... Um, you see this a lot in landfills. They'll pick at everything that's there. Um, the other problem that ends up happening with these birds is that a lot of fruit orchards will lose millions of dollars in product to these birds from cherry orchards, um, grape, field, or grape vineyards, all these different fruit places that could produce the smaller size fruit will lose millions of dollars in product to these birds every year. Uh, they were actually, these are also an introduced species. These were brought in, where did that go? Oh, I 
Here we go. After two failed attempts, about 60 common starlings were released in 1890 in New York's Central Park. He was the president of the American Acclimatization Society. So basically their idea was to see how well an introduced species does in an environment that it's not made to be around. Um, and they tried to introduce every species mentioned in the William Shakespeare, uh, or in the works of William Space Shakespeare into North America. Um, at the same, about the same date, the Portland Songbird Club released 35 common pairs of starlings in Portland, Oregon. And so the birds actually became established in 1902. Um, the common starlings reappeared in the Pacific Northwest in the mid-1940s. Uh, these were the most likely the descendants of the 1890 uh, uh group. The original 60s swelled up to numbers of 150 million across North America. That is 150 million starlings in North America alone. And they've been all over the place. Um, 1901 in the West Indies, uh, one of the colonial secretaries um, Petition, an inhabitant petitioned the colonial secretary for a government grant of starlings to exterminate, to, to, to exterminate an outbreak of grasshoppers that were destroying uh, grain crops. The, the starlings were introduced in 1930, uh, and they were naturally colonized, and then the, in the Bahamas and Cuba, wait, let me, I'm reading this right. Common starlings was introduced to Jamaica in 1903, and the Bahamas and Cuba were colonized naturally from the U.S., so they just naturally migrated their way down to the in, uh, the, the islands that we have. Um, the global population, the global population of the starling, is estimated to be three hundred and ten million birds across the planet. And they have been listed as least concern in every single country because there are just so many. Um, and then they have a different list, and we have a little list of um, things that they can, the pros and cons from the birds. Um, they will definitely uh, damage fruit orchards, uh, grapes, peaches, olives, currants, and tomatoes, or new and dig up newly grain, uh, newly sown grain and corn. So they will absolutely destroy freshly planted fields. Um, same with livestock. They will actually eat cattle feed or any kind of livestock feed. The problem that ends up happening with that, with these birds, is they'll roost on the sides of the bins where the animals come to feed out of the troughs, and then they'll poop inside of those troughs. And when the animals eat it, they can contract salmonella from, the anim from these birds' droppings. So this goes with the, the starling, the sparrow, and the and the uh, pigeon. This is all all three of these birds can cause this problem for cattle, especially. Excuse me. Um, uh, they have actually been sucked into jet engines. Um, has been that has been a known problem with these types of birds is they because they try to nest in different areas they have pulled them out of airports airplanes all these different things a lot of uh smaller airports will actually and bigger ones too will actually hire in falconers to be on the property flying their birds around keeping all the little birds away from being able to get sucked up into these into the airplane engines um, there's a bunch of different things of people trying to um, keep them controlled. I mean, I do that a lot. A lot of, for me, it's securing homes, closing out vents, cleaning out vent pipes. It was, like I said, the one with the 15 pounds was a bit of an eye-opener, too, just because of how much that these birds will pack into a nesting area just for their offspring. Um, Some places actually try to keep them as pets because um, they got the, they have the name of the poor man's dog or quote unquote something to love because the nestlings are easy to obtain from the wild and after a little bit of hand freeing they can be look, looked after in a captive environment. They adapt well to captivity and thrive on a diet of standard bird feed and mealworms. 
if you can get them to actually eat real better stuff, then so be it. Um, some areas have started keeping them um, almost as easily as the uh, domestic pigeon is the other thing with them. Uh, but basically, the, these birds are just a problem is the biggest thing about them. Um, there's a couple different things that can be done because they'll pull other birds out of their nesting areas, they'll bully others from their, their own nesting areas too. So I'm a little all over the place, guys. Um, it's been a, I had a very long day today, so I'm trying to keep up with the information as best as I can. Um, we actually, um, <laughs> a quick story, I'll have to have, um, James is one of my coworkers. I'll have to have him on here at some point to talk about one of his experiences of a starling inside of a home with that involved a 20-foot collapsing rod with a with a net taped to the top of it. I'll have to have him on and uh, talk about that one. Uh, we had I had a house where the starling had made a nest and it fell with the, the fledglings too. All, all the fledglings were just about ready to, to be able to fly and be on their way. The fledglings walked back uh, along the pipe of the bathroom. If this is a bathroom fan. And the fan, it, the pipe dropped and then connected to the actual fan itself. And so <laughs> I go and I drop the fan from the ceiling in order to pull everybody out. And six birds start flying around the bathroom, just going absolutely every which way. It's a mess of nesting, straw, birds, there's bird mites in the air. I'm trying to keep these birds from hitting me in the face. So I'm just reaching around. Think, think of those um, containers where you're grabbing the cash as it's blowing around in the air. That's me trying to grab six starlings that had just fallen out of a bathroom fan inside of a very small bathroom so that was one of the uh it's one of the more memorable uh incidences of dealing with a starling that has fallen down the back of a pipe um, i get it all the time also where they will fall down behind a microwave um, i've opened up a microwave and a starling came flying out of it because he found his way into the actual microwave housing it was one of those super fancy ones that the duct connected directly to the top of it go figure so uh, we're going to switch gears to the house sparrow. So the house sparrow is another European descent type of bird. They're very small and you see them everywhere. Um, they are probably more widespread than the starling and the pigeon in terms of um, how many of them are in different areas? So let's see, get to the start of my notes here. Oh, where did that go? Well, we'll get to that in a second. So with these sparrows, um, they are also cavity dwellers as well, just like the starling. So they will nest in different areas the exact same way. So bathroom vents, eve vents, um, <clears throat> dryer vents, any of those kind of things. The other thing that gives them away is they have a, a light gray cap that comes all the way down to the peak of their uh, top of their beak. You can see on the picture here, as well as they have those cheek pads uh, in order to help designate um, them from other sparrows as well. Um, they're very much they're very they're chatty birds, but they are very much the chirp chirp that you would associate for most sparrow types. Um, there could be, there's a, anywhere up to 12 subspecies of house sparrows. And they're spread all around the world. Um, there's 25 species of the, um, the passer genus, which is the, uh, the house sparrow. It's passer domesticus, the, domest the house sparrow. That's how they got the Latin name. Um, in terms of population, ah yes, in terms of the population, there are, from a, a, an estimated study 
done in 2013. They estimated there's anywhere from 82 million birds in North America alone. These, and they have easily since then buffeted above the 120, 130 million bird um, count at this point, just based on how fast they do it. The other thing about these birds is they are gnarly. When it comes to demanding for nesting locations, they will compete with others such as uh, swallows and swifts. Because um, swifts, you can put up a nesting box for a chimney, for not a chimney swift, but like a, a swallow, like a scissor tail swallow. And what will happen is a sparrow will come along and try to wrestle them out of the nest. Well, the problem is the swallows can't really fight. Their beaks are made for catching insects on the fly. Sparrow beaks, you can see their beak is actually incredibly, it's big, blunt, it's made for cracking seeds and, and uh, getting into grain. So they're able to fight and they will literally maul a swift inside of their nest box in order to take it over for an actual nesting location. And they will get in there and they will literally tear the bird apart. They'll kill the mates, they'll kill both the birds, they'll kill other fledgings and they'll, they'll kill the eggs that are down there and then they build it up to create their own uh, nesting area. Now there is, and this was something I was finding in my research, there's a couple things that can be done. There's actually a, what's called a slot box or the Hughes slot box. Uh, house sparrows prefer deep boxes because they can build their dome. When they build their nest, they actually build it out as a dome in order to make themselves feel more secure. This slot box is shallow and it prevents them from being able to build that dome and it gives the native birds a chance to be able to nest inside this location. So and you can look these up online, just be careful how you be careful how you search. Yeah, careful how you search this. You want to look up the Hughes slot box. Okay? I know I know some of you out there. I know how you think. Um but that's when that's one trick that can be done to help make sure that our native species actually get a chance. Um, and these guys cause just the exact same problems as the pigeon and the starling. They get into feed, they get into grain, they get into all the different areas they shouldn't be, and end up causing health issues for an obscene amount of other problems. Um, One method that people have been trying to do is they'll open up the nest boxes and put fake sparrow eggs inside the uh, nest box. So basically they sit on the eggs eternally wondering why haven't they hatched. So the idea is that when they don't hatch, it stops them, the female from being able to uh, release the reproductive hormone to make her go uh, ready to ovulate and produce more eggs in the future. So it basically tricks them into thinking that that's not happening. Um, and the other thing with these birds is you see them literally everywhere. You'll find them in food courts, you'll find them in zoos, you'll find them anywhere that there's easy enough food and where there's people. Because people feed the birds. Everybody wants to see the birds survive. Here's my stance on feeding birds. Don't. Just don't. These birds do not need our help. If anything, Feeding birds that are wild um, makes it very hard for them to learn how to be wild when you suddenly aren't there anymore. Say so you have your bird feeders, you move within a year. Those birds have been habitually coming to you for so long that they don't realize that they should know how to actually feed and forage properly. So they're depending on you for food, and that becomes its own detriment if something happens to you um, dealing with all this. The other problem with bird feeders is that it creates a, um, a hub of potential disease transmission. Uh, this actually just happened this year with a salmonella outbreak with the pine siskins. They're a little, uh, a little bird that a lot of people have them at their feeders. The problem was that if, they land, if an infected bird landed on the bird feeder, the salmonella contagion would stay on the bird feeder and you could potentially spread it to all sorts of other birds at that point. They were Fish and Wildlife this year was suggesting to make sure you keep your bird feeders down, clean, stored away for the time being. And I absolutely agree that that needs to be taken into consideration. If you are going to have bird feeders, you have to take the extra mile. Try to find 
um, individual uh, type of seeds. Like don't use the mix. Don't use the 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 trail the party trail mix or whatever there is of the bird feed. Try to stay with one type. So like the the oily <clears throat> sunflower seeds, or like a suet box or a suet brick. Those work really well for woodpeckers, nuthatches, and uh, so, uh, similar associated birds. With the bird feeders, they'll pick through the mix and throw it on the ground. Well, what else does that happen with that? I'm gonna tell you. What ends up happening is then you get rats, mice, raccoons, squirrels, more animals that you, want, that you don't want hanging around your property if you can help it. The other thing it draws in, cats. Outdoor cats and feral cats specifically. Cats are one of the biggest killers of songbirds across the world. And I'm not going to get into cats here because that is a very touchy subject for a lot of people. So we were going, we will make that a subject possibly for another day. Or I might just record that and put it on YouTube in general uh, because I know I'm going to rub somebody's ire on my uh, thoughts about that. But we're going to make sure it is scientific because that is a lot of what we deal with here is a lot of our discussions are about science, statistics, and facts, just to make sure everybody is going to be able to make an informed decision. And if you guys think I'm saying something wrong or I have bad information, tell me. Send me a link. Send me a source. Send me anything. I'll be the first to say, I don't know everything. I know enough to make sure I sound very educated. And I have done a lot of training. I have done a lot of educational seminars for stuff like this. But I don't know everything. And I want to know everything. So send me information if you guys um, aren't sure if something sounded right or something didn't sound right. Um, but otherwise, with these birds, there's that pretty much covers everything. Because um, when you talk about one, they, they kind of talks about the rest <laughs> in terms of what it all covers. So but these three in particular are the three invasive species of North America. Um, it will be an interesting discussion about domesticated animals versus wildlife. Okay, so you're going to have to we'll have to embellish about that, like in terms of a like a cat and a dog versus their with their encounters versus a raccoon and a skunk, or more. Um, well, send me a message on uh, through Twitch, and we can talk about more what we what we'd want to cover with that. But I'm going to sign off for here, guys. Um, We've covered just about all I can with the information I have gathered at present. Um, but thank you all for hanging out. I appreciate the two of you, Antoinette and uh, Los, Los Corcor. I appreciate you guys hanging out with me this evening. So I'm going to sign off here for the night. Thanks again. We'll see you on another time.